Well, good morning, folks. I'm delighted to have the, uh, the chance to be here. It's been a wonderful conference so far. It's one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, things I've learned so far include that the uh, most important difference between uh, Leo Strine and the Pope is one of jurisdiction. Uh, I would have thought infallibility, but no. um, so um, um, I'm thrilled to be here. My favorite part about the, the conference and the reason I think it's such a valuable event is that it's a place where um, those of us who spend a lot of time on the law and institutional detail about the firms that we study get to spend time with economists who think about questions uh, of methodology. And you'll see that the paper that we've chosen to present today is one that um, draws on those uh, questions. Um, and in particular, you'll see that the commenter, Emiliano Catan, um, is uh, somebody who is especially uh, expert at helping improve papers just like this one uh, that has methodological questions associated with it. For that reason, um, it should be an exciting morning. You're going to um, see me get taken to the woodshed. Um, but I'm happy to be um, uh, sacrificial for the purpose uh, because uh, you'll see, I think the paper has some interesting findings, but we need to figure out what they are. So, um, <laughs> so um, the paper is at a reasonably, uh, reasonably um, uh, I would like to say it's at an early stage. That's a lie. We're two years into the paper. But um, we're still figuring out exactly what the right frame and what the right institutional focus should be. So having confessed all this, let me tell you about the paper, uh, and then I'll let uh, Emiliano destroy my uh, career. So uh, but to start, um, here we study uh, poison pills, um, famous takeover defenses. And of course, one great thing about being at a conference like this is that we are here with uh, colleagues and friends who have been central to the debate. On the one hand, poison pills and similar takeover defenses risk imposing uh, significant agency costs, uh, um, uh, a point advanced uh, forcefully by so many colleagues, but especially by my colleague Ron Gilson and Rainier Crackman in 1989. On the other hand, poison pills offer the hope that managers can make longer term investments, or so says uh, my former uh, boss, I should disclose, Marty Lipton, the inventor of the poison pill, proud of his invention and all the long term investments it has produced. On the um, uh, Connors have been studying the value effects of poison pills for a generation, and not so successfully, it turns out. The problem with most poison pill studies, as many of you probably already know, is that they suffer from a particular kind of endogeneity. That is, um, the characteristics of a firm might dictate whether and when they adopt uh, a poison pill. And thus, the early studies in the mid-1980s that study the value effects of takeover defenses suffered from a, a fundamental problem of exogeneity, one that um, Emiliano and his uh, co-author and colleague Marcel Kahan have pointed out makes the studies more or less um, uh, uh, uninformative with respect to the causal implications of takeover defenses. No, what we need in order to study the causal effects of takeover defenses is an exogenous event, a truly clean external legal event that changes the law of takeover defenses in a way that's independent of the determinants of adopting such a defense at the firm level. And sadly, we, uh, when it comes to standard operating firms, we don't have such an event. Although I should say Alan Farrell, who's here today, has written a terrific paper with my co-author on this paper, uh, Martin Kremers. It's co-authored work with Martin and John Morley. Alan's paper shows, uh, with Martin shows that the, uh, uh, the governance Im value implications of certain governance mechanisms changed after the Delaware Supreme Court uh, approved the poison pill in 1985. But there's no truly clean, exogenous legal event at the state law level about poison pills. And that's what we hope to offer in this study. In this study, we focus on one particular kind of firm, a very strange kind, you'll see, closed-end mutual funds. And we show that there was at least one, I'll say, maybe as many as three truly exogenous changes to the federal law of poison pills uh, that we can use to study their value implications. Now, you can see already the upside of a study like this to the degree that you buy my claims about the events is that we have plausible exogeneity and thus a plausible, a plausible causal design. The downside is we're studying a very narrow category of firms, so I'll confess right away. The degree to which you think these results generalizable will depend. First of all, on your views about the poison pill, which I have found in this crowd can be like asking you about religion or love. Moreover, they'll depend on your intuitions about how similar closed-end funds are to other kinds of firms. More on which in a moment. But first, let me tell you about the study's design. So first, I should tell you about closed-end funds. It's not obvious that um, that would be something you'd spend a lot of time on. For your sake, I hope not. Uh, 
closed-end funds go public um, and offer investors the opportunity to invest in the fund. Um, and when, once they have done this, unlike an open-ended fund, investors cannot approach the fund and request redemption of their shares. Does this make sense? So investors do not have the option that they have in open-end funds to go to the fund, pledge their shares, and ask for the cash relating to the underlying assets in exchange for those shares. No, to get liquid, to get uh, cash in exchange for those shares, what a closed-end fund investor has to do is go to another investor, who, of course, will provide liquidity for those shares, but at a price. For this reason, the uh, shares in closed-end funds trade at a discount to their net asset value. This is a phenomenon that's been extensively studied. Um, my colleague Wei Zhang, in a paper in the Journal of Finance in 2010, with Bradley and others, showed that as a result of this discount to net asset value, these firms are uniquely ripe for takeover attacks. What the takeover artists do, one of them, Bulldog Investors in New York, um, what they do is they acquire enough shares in the fund, they amend its corporate documents to turn it from a closed-end fund to an open-ended fund. They push the managers to redeem the assets quickly and to cash out the shares um, uh, closer to net asset value. And they gain the difference between the price at which they acquired the, uh, the shares and the value of those assets. So as a result of this, because these funds are always exposed to this attack, they use two uh, takeover defenses as a means to thwart it. The first is the poison pill. We'll st say more about that in a moment. The second are staggered boards. And I want to say a little bit about staggered boards, because this is going to be an exogenous, I'm going to claim that it's an exogenous study of the effects of the poison pill. And if I were you, my first thought would be, well, wouldn't you see different results depending on whether the firm has a staggered board? I mean, that's been established in the literature for some time. And certainly when we designed this study, we hoped just to find just that. The reason we did is that previous work in this area, there's a JFE piece from a couple of years ago by Matthew Souther, has suggested that there's heterogeneity in closed-end funds as to whether they have staggered boards. This paper, for example, suggests that maybe 65 to 70% of the funds do have staggered boards, 35% don't, and when I see that, I think of an empirical opportunity. There's heterogeneity. I can see the varying effects of the events. But what we've done over the last couple of years is study more carefully what's going on in the funds, and my co-author, John Morley, who's an expert in this area, um, has um, plumbed into the depths of Maryland and Delaware law and discovered that, in fact, that's not right. Overwhelmingly, these funds have staggered boards, more than about 90% of them, in fact. As a result, something I don't have for you today is variability in the staggered board status of these funds. No, most of them have staggered boards. Overwhelmingly, nearly all of them have staggered boards. 75% of them, like Souther found, have the kinds of staggered boards you're thinking of. Folks amended the charter or bylaws, and they have staggered elections. But we found two other, frankly, kind of clever and sneaky ways that these firms achieve staggered boards. One is they give their directors indefinite terms of service. Now, you might think, as you see that, well, that's illegal. I teach corporations, you'll say, and under Delaware law, indefinite terms are not permissible. But not all these funds are governed by Delaware law. No, instead, they're statutory trusts, either in Delaware or Massachusetts. And those entities can have indefinite terms. Another 10% of our firms have, the effect, have effectively staggered or even longer um, uh, board terms as a result of that fact. Here's something else that's interesting. People know this, but it's not widely reported in the literature. Another 11% of the funds are incorporated in Maryland. And in 1999, Maryland adopted a very interesting statute that allows any Maryland corporation, including these, to stagger at will. The board of directors can at any time, by resolution, no shareholder approval, stagger up. As a result, they have what we call in the revised version of the paper, a shadow staggered board. Always the possibility of adopting a, a staggered board. When we count those firms, we get a sample that has 90% or more staggered boards. By the way, given that these firms are always under attack, that doesn't seem so surprising to me. But what it, get, what it deprives me of as a researcher is heterogeneity in the, uh, in the sample. So I won't be able to offer that, but with that limitation, I'll say a little bit about what we can study here. First thing I want to say is we have some general theories about why poison pills might be beneficial. Putting to one side the famous Gilson-Crackman -Crack argument 
that it may be value destroying in the form of agency costs, you can imagine some theories as to why they might be valuable. I mentioned Marty Lipton's work. The basic idea is that this acts as a commitment device. Managers can make long-term investments confident that they'll retain control even if the wisdom of their decisions isn't immediately evident to the market. By contrast, so these are general theories that would convince you of the value of takeover defenses in all kinds of firms. But I want to be forthright and say that you might see theories that make these defenses especially valuable or uniquely valuable in closed-end funds. And one thing we'll be debating, I hope uh, with Emiliano's help, is the degree to which these closed-end funds are like or are not like other firms. So for example, closed-end funds tend to invest in illiquid securities. If they're attacked and taken over, they will have to uh, uh, liquidate those securities quickly. There's some risk of a fire sale, and as a result, the investors might like the takeover defense to the degree that it protects them from the value-destroying consequences of the fire sale. That's one possibility. Another is that the funds, to the degree that they worry about a, an attack and an opening up attack, they have to hold cash on their balance sheet in order to redeem the shares for cash. Cash is a relatively unproductive asset. Investors seeing this might like the idea of having a takeover defense. Finally, there's a tax argument to make. The investors in closed-end funds usually like to defer taxes, like all of us. When a fund is opened up and the assets sold and distributions made to shareholders, they recognize a tax event that they'd rather not. So for all these reasons, you might think these specific things about closed-end funds make takeover defenses uniquely good in this context in a way they might not be in other firms. That's a theoretical setup. Now you might be wondering, why have you spent the first half of your presentation talking about I am. <laughs> about life in general or just my presentation? <laughs> I see, okay. The, <laughs> the reason is that these funds are governed by the Investment Company Act. Uh, unlike usual public companies, operating firms that are um, uh, subject to the 33 and 34 acts as the case may be, these guys are subject to the 40 act which has a unique provision that implicates poison pills. In particular, it says that any rights or options to acquire uh, shares in a fund that's subject to the 40 Act, as these funds are, must be issued ratably. This word should catch your eye, because if you know about the poison pill, you know that poison pills, by definition, do not distribute shares ratably. They discriminate between the hostile attacker and uh, the other investors in the fund. So for years, it wasn't clear whether or not this statute allowed funds to use poison pills. And then we got three events between 2004 and 2009 that shed light on the legality of poison pills. First, a district judge in Maryland in 2004 ruled that poison pills were OK. And this surprised the market. And I can show you some evidence that the market was surprised and the value implications of that. 2007, the same judge said not only can these funds use poison pills, but they can renew them serially, which was another uh, doubtful legal proposition under the Investment Company Act. These two events, as I'll show you in a minute, are interesting, but I'm skeptical about their true, the, the, the degree to which they're really good uh, causal identification strategies. The reason is that people were anticipating the judge's ruling, that um, the exact moment of issuing the ruling were not so clear. My favorite event in this study is this event in November 2009. In November 2009, Andrew Donahue, who was the head of the Division of Investment Management, gave a speech in Florida to closed-end funds. Feels like they would have to meet in Florida, right? The closed-end funds um, annual conference. He shows up and says, I just want you guys to know, I've thought this over. I'm the director of the Division of Investment Management. I think that poison pills violate the 40 Act. Any questions? And thereupon, it was an actually really interesting thing to study because lawyers will tell you, and we've done many interviews on the point, that they rushed out of the room to email their clients. Stagger your board. You have a serious problem. They publish law firm memos that we uh, uh, point to in the paper that show uh, that this is what uh, they were thinking. And in fact, we give evidence in the paper that immediately after the speech, several funds staggered up, fearful that they were no longer able to use the poison pill. So we uh, evaluate the uh, value implications of these effects. I can give you some detail about how we do it. We have two methods of uh, looking at abnormal returns. Uh, benchmark adjusted returns, which is just the 
uh, relevant fund minus its benchmark, depending on the asset class. I can say more about that in Q&A. Um, we also just do um, a model that depends on the bench benchmark factors. And then we look at the discount to net asset value. We try to look at three different ways to measure the value effects of this, uh, of this event. Now, before I show you the results, I want to come clean, more than I already have, which is to point out to you that you should be skeptical about event study returns for this asset class. And the reason is, closed-end funds have been in the finance literature for about a decade, the example of behavioral finance. Nobody understands why anybody owns them, why they trade the way they do, and they've made clear, by the way, that the investors who own them are individuals who care more about general sentiment than they do the underlying asset values. Let me just give you one example. A famous AER piece, Pontiff 1997, shows that the vol volatility of closed-end fund prices far exceeds the volatility of the underlying assets. That should not be, but it is. And people wonder whether this can tell tells us whether returns on closed-end funds can tell us much. Nevertheless, I'm going to give you some reasons why I think we can still learn from the example. I just want you to know the methodological uh, limitations. So um, I'll go through these in detail for time reasons uh, later. But for present purposes, know this. The first event in 2004 and the second event in 2007, no matter how you measure it, led to very significant value increases. Investors reacted positively when they thought closed-end funds could use takeover defenses. And then in, in uh, 2009, investors reacted overwhelmingly negatively when the SEC took the position that as a matter of federal law, these funds could not use poison pills. Now, I'll walk through the details of the, uh, uh, of the findings with you in a minute, but for now, I want you to see that there's reasons to think that investors might like these defenses in these funds for very different reasons that they might like them in operating companies. So to the degree that you feel this is counterintuitive, remember the limited context that we're thinking about, just for closed-end funds. And in this context, for me, it's not that shocking that investors didn't like it when the SEC decided one day to make this defense, bless you, completely illegal for every fund. And that's exactly what they said. Now, you might say, well, Jackson, you just explained to us that returns in this asset class don't tell us much at all. How, do, how can you say anything interesting about these events? My answer is we're not the first to grapple with this particular problem, the behavioral finance side of closed-end funds. And in a revised version of the paper, what we do is we do a longer-term event study. And this is what um, uh, Wei Zhang and my other colleagues did in that 2010 journal finance paper. They look at the effect of the event over a longer period of time so that the short-run volatility um, uh, and, and, uh, and alpha that comes out of closed-end fund returns can be washed out over time. And we do that here for the, uh, for the first two events, and we get somewhat mixed results. But what we see very clearly is that the third event led to a, a significant and long-run value decrease in these funds. We show that in a one-week specification, we show it in a two-week specification, and we have further uh, longer-term uh, um, uh, analyses that we do. I'm happy to share those, too. But in this revised version of the paper, we do something new that we hope to get your thoughts about. We break down the sample as between firms that have previously had a proxy fight or activist intervention in the fund and those that have not. That is, firms where there's been an attack on management and firms where there's never been such an attack. And we break down our analysis as between those two classes of firms. And we see that in the funds that have had a previous proxy fight or a previous activist intervention, the results are flipped. That is, we see that investors, where they have raised questions about management's viability, about their wisdom, they actually don't like <laughs> the illegality of takeover defenses. They react negatively to, uh, 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 to the court decisions providing for that. And they react positively in those funds when the SEC outlaws those defenses. This makes sense to me. The answer to the existential question of what is the value of takeover defenses is to give the lawyer's typical answer, it depends. And it depends on the, on the investor's view about the wisdom of management and, um, um, uh, and the discretion they're willing to give them. So before I um, uh, uh, let Emiliano help me figure this out or otherwise destroy it, I want to say um, 
a couple of things about the, the paper. First, on the one hand, studying this very narrow class of firms tells us relatively little about the entire debate over the value of takeover defenses. But on the other hand, studying just this area under the streetlight gives us something we haven't had before, which is a plausibly exogenous change to the law. And that might be worth pursuing. You know, it's hard to know, something I'm struggling with with the paper, it's hard to know how generalizable these results are or aren't. What's not difficult to predict is how the various players in the war over takeover defenses will use the results in advance of their agenda. Which makes me wonder about exactly how I should think about publishing them. That is, on the one hand, I mean, it's like a existential kind of question. On the one hand, what degree to which, uh, uh, when you have doubts about a study like this, do you want to share those doubts and publish them? Or do you want to say, given the limitations, it's not clear that we know um, uh, much from the study at all? So those are my thoughts. Looking forward to Emiliano's comments. All right. So I'm Emiliano Catan from Emmanuel and I'm very, very thankful for being able to be here discussing this really, really interesting paper by, by Rob. So let me quickly summarize what the paper is about. What's the, how does the likelihood that some anti-takeover defenses will be held, liable, will be held valid, valid by courts, uh, how does that likelihood affect uh, the closed-end funds value? That's what the paper is all about. In terms of a summary of the findings, the paper looks at uh, the return that the stocks of these closed end funds experience around essentially two sets of events. A first pair of events that seemingly suggested that the validity of this particular set of anti takeover devices that they look at poison pills and control share acquisition statutes would be more likely to be upheld. Uh, and the finding seems to be that markets negatively reacted to that, uh, negatively, positively reacted to, to that uh, legal development. Then they look at uh, the returns that the uh, stocks experienced in response to the later statements by the uh, SEC director that suggested that the, under the 40 Act, the control share acquisition opt-ins and the poison pill adoptions would not be held uh, valid. And seemingly the finding is that the markets reacted negatively. Interestingly, when they look more thoroughly and they break down the sample into firms that have been previously targeted or were uh, currently under some kind of activism event, the finding seems to be at least that the effect disappears and maybe the, the, the paper even suggests that the signs flip. So we'll, uh, we'll revisit that in the context of the discussion. So here's a quick roadmap of what I'm planning on discussing. First, I'll tackle a, a pet peeve of mine, so to speak, which is the fact that the, the law and finance literature often does a, a pretty poor job at discussing how some legal shock that they claim to exploit leads to the ascribed results. So I'm going to push Rob and his co-authors to spend uh, a significant uh, amount of time in, in telling us exactly how these legal shocks, events one to three, could possibly have led to responses in terms of the uh, close and funds values. Second, in the spirit of uh, going along some of these methodological challenges, I will spend, I, I will uh, suggest that Rob and his co-authors uh, perform a bunch of exercises trying to kick the tires of the results as they currently report them. And finally, if I have time, I'll spend some time uh, discussing or suggesting further uh, lines of research that they could follow uh, uh, on the basis of the results that they currently have. Okay, so just to be sure we are all on the same page, although Rob did a, a really good job discussing this, uh, let me spend a few seconds discussing the institutional setting. Poison pills in particular, and to some extent, uh, control share acquisition statutes, put an upper cap on the maximum number of shares of a firm that an activist or a hostile bidder can acquire without the blessing of the board of directors. In the case of Plain Manila Corporation, particularly so Delaware Incorporated Plain Manila Corporations, this has resulted in the channeling of hostile acquisition attempts into proxy fights. And that's what makes the board structure, as, as Rob discussed, really, really important. There's a, a very strong, uh, there are very strong synergies or complementarities between a staggered board structure and the availability of a poison pill. Although the, the current version of the paper seems to suggest that they are uh, substitutes, I would probably word it in terms of complements. And I think this is a more standard wording or, or description of where the, the, what the state of the law is. So let me first, in, in the spirit of trying to tease out what effect we would have expected these events to, to, to lead to, let me spend a few minutes discussing what I describe as the highest pie scenario. Under what settings would we have expected these events to have a, the most, most powerful effect on, on the closed and funds uh, share prices? 
So first of all, it would have to be the case that, so if this highest byte scenario consists of the following, before the event one took place, everyone must have believed that the pills and the control center acquisition opt-ins were clearly invalid under the 40 Act. Moreover, the activists must have taken advantage of the unavailability uh, of these anti-takeover defenses by acquiring blocks far in excess of the typical trigger of a poison pill or a control share acquisition, right? The typical triggers are in the order of 10 to 15% of the firm shares. <clears throat> Moreover, activists would have systematically used those blocks then to control the uh, board structure of the close end funds and to then force buybacks, liquidations, fund openings, or wholesale acquisitions, right? So that's part of what would have been at play in the highest byte scenario. Moreover, the ability to engage in activism must have created an environment in which all these close end funds live in a, in a state of nature, so to speak. Everybody's life was nasty, brutish, and short. They were really, really concerned that they would be targeted by one of these activists and they would be running for the hills anytime soon. Then, between event one and event three, event three, remember, is the one where the SEC director. Uh, actually clarified that from the SEC's or his own personal perspective, which seemingly the market took to be the SEC's perspective, these things were actually not valid. So between event one and event three, everyone must have uh, now believed that pills and controversial acquisition opt-ins were clearly valid. Moreover, the expectation that funds would immediately react by adopting a pill or opting into a controversial acquisition statute would have dramatically reduced the expected profit that activists thought they would be able to fetch from engaging in one of, one of these activism campaigns. And as a result, the incidence of activism campaigns would have uh, dropped dramatically. Right? So again, I'm trying to describe the highest buy scenario where these uh, legal developments would have had the, the most powerful uh, effect on the, the prices of these closed end funds. Finally, after event three, we would have gone back to square one. Right? So in trying to assess how much of a buy did the, uh, these this, uh, three legal events have. Let's try to compare, I'm going to push Rob actually to give us more details in, in uh, later versions of the paper, to give us more details describing how far or how close we are to this highest byte scenario. Let me just spend a few minutes discussing on the basis of, of some stylized facts reported in the paper, what I think, where I think we really are in terms of distance to that highest byte scenario. So how frequently were funds being targeted by activists before event one? We actually don't have the breakdown for that in the paper, but let me do a couple of back of the envelope cal uh, calculations. The paper reports that overall in the 20 year period they are sampling, there were a total of 361 13D filings and 154 proxy fights. My uh, quick uh, download of data from Chris, uh, Chris suggests that there were about 7,000 close and fun year observations. Although the paper suggests that I'm actually quite short there. There may be uh, about twice as many close and fun year observations. So that suggests, again, a quick back of the envelope calculation that um, under this conser conservative assumption of the number of firms at risk, that maybe about 5% of the funds experience some activist campaign each year, and that maybe 2.2% of the funds experience uh, approximate each year. Moreover, the paper is explicit about the fact that less than half of these challenges actually succeed. So this is quite far from the state of nature I described as my uh, highest byte scenario. Second thing, so how frequently did activists exploit the seeming prohibition to adopt bills or opt into controversial acquisition statutes before 2004, before the first event in our timeline? Uh, in particular, for example, how frequently did activists acquire a block of shares that would trigger a standard, let's say a 15% bill, or that would trigger a standard control share acquisition statute? Unfortunately, I don't think the paper actually spells it out, but it's actually something really worth uh, discussing and documenting. Interestingly, the, the Bradley uh, and Jiang and uh, Brav, et cetera, paper that the paper relies upon significantly is really explicit in a footnote about the fact that takeovers are virtually non-existent in the closed end fund industry. So these activist events, they typically consist of somebody trying to open up the firm, force buybacks, and so forth and so on. But very, very rarely, at least the paper documents, do these things actually amount to wholesale acquisitions, which would be the situation in which the pill would be the most important. Right? If somebody simply buys 10% of a firm to push management to uh, buy back shares, the pill is neither here nor there. Maybe, of course, these people would be more capable of uh, influencing the board if they were able to get to 20 to 30%. But it's, insofar as I'm not trying to acquire the firm wholesale, the bite of the availability or unavailability of the pill becomes slightly less significant in the story. 
some pushback Rob could offer is that Horetzi, the activist that uh, leads to the, all of this story, actually launched a tender offer for up to 50% of the shares in the Neuberger Berman Fund. So maybe things changed between the sample period analyzed by uh, Bradley et al. and the later part of a sample period covered by Rob's study. So I'm really, really curious to hear about, given that you have the 13Ds, what's the typical holding that the 13Ds uh, report when these activists uh, go after firms? If it's closer to 10 to 15%, then again, we are getting further and further away from the uh, highest byte scenario. If it's much higher than 15%, then the story for why your legal shocks could have the effect that you ascribe to them becomes more compelling. Between event one and event three, so many questions that come, up to, that come to mind that the paper is not currently documenting, but I, I think you have a data to document this. Uh, what happened with the incidents and the chances of success of activist campaigns? So again, remember, this is the time period when firms had the most anti-takeover defenses within their reach. Uh, did the size of the blocks acquired by activists become me meaningfully smaller after the anti-takeover defenses become, became available? How frequently did funds adopt poison pills in response to an activist attempt? Right? All of these things, the availability of the pill is completely irrelevant, but for some out of the equilibrium story that becomes not so believable. If we ask how many firms adopted pills, and the answer is one. Newberger Berman, right? So by contrast, if we have tens upon, or dozens upon dozens of firms adopting pills, the story becomes more plausible again. By the way, for those of you who are biting your nails, wondering about what had happened with the Newberger Berman fund that was targeted by Horetzi, those guys, well, they won a couple of battles, but they actually lost the war. They had to liquidate the fund, despite the fact that the uh, that two, two courts had validated in events one and two the anti-takeover defenses that those guys adopted. So again, this further uh, enhances my concerns or bolsters my concerns about how strong or how much of a bite these uh, legal events had. <clears throat> so to summarize what, I, what I've been discussing so far, the further and further we get from the uh, highest bite scenario, the less confidence I have that these events actually had an effect. To be sure, the abnormal returns, the paper reports are not off the charts, so 20, 30, 50 basis points could perhaps possibly be triggered by a small bite event. Uh, but in any event, I would really encourage you to spend much more time discussing this because it's helpful for the reader to actually be able to grasp what's going on and to be able to uh, better gauge what the external validity of the, the paper is for the broader uh, question of the effect of anti-takeover devices. So in the spirit of uh, helping you kick the tires of the current results, let me try to go through as many of these exercises as possible. Exercise number one. So you essentially have three one-date event studies. One's concern with one-date event studies is that there may be cross-sectional correlation in the errors of the firms that suffer the event, right? That may lead to way overblown T stats. What do you do to handle that? And, and this is, I should add, it's particularly concerning in a context in which the underlying issuers are all investing in the same kind of things, which is exactly what's going on here. What do you do to take care of that, or at least to mitigate that concern? You adjust your tests as, for example, following that paper in the RFS. Suggestion number two, you could give much more detail, for example, by reporting a graph with the abnormal returns and cumulative abnormal returns over, let's say, the minus 2020 window. That is useful. First, because if there's really a lot of cross-sectional correlation, then your T-stats will also be blown up in the pre-treatment period, so to speak, in the pre-event uh, period. Uh, so to the extent that your T-stats are not really there before the treatment, that's all in, in the favor of the, uh, the causal interpretation of your result. Second, I find it to be much more transparent or hands above, hands above the table. If you see something like this flat, 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 and then when the event kicks in, you see the response, that becomes a much more uh, compelling story for the reader to, to buy into. And it's much harder, by contrast, or, or on, on the flip side, for the identification police to challenge. Kicking the tires number two. So event three occurred at noon. That's a nice thing to exploit, yeah, right? You could use high frequency data and show us that the effect actually kicked in, so the, the zero one effect that you ascribe to the event actually kicked in after the moment when then you see the ticker tape. For a nice example where somebody did something like that, look at a paper by Bo and, and Guhan where they looked at the proxy access uh, case, right? So they did exactly that. They looked at have high frequency data and they show that the event kicks in or triggers up in terms of, of stock prices right when, when it should be kicking in. Check whether the funds who experience the most positive Q 
cumulative abnormal returns in, in event one are the same ones who experience the most negative uh, abnormal returns in event one, right? So let's look at the two strings of returns under event one and under event three. Each row corresponds to a given fund. If the graph looks like this, very, so the ones that experience very, very positive returns in event one experience very, very negative events, uh, returns in event two, that becomes, uh, this makes it more possible that you're actually picking up something costly. If by contrast it looks like a completely random scatter shot, I'm not sure I would be buying into a story so much. A couple of things I didn't quite understand. So you're reporting something in table seven that, so, so far I guess this is a, a last minute thing you include in the paper. You're not reporting what specification you estimated. What's the sample? I couldn't quite tell. So you seem to be looking at weeks uh, worth of data, but this, so this is the one day thing, that's the weekly thing, or the seemingly weekly thing, but this, this is not seven exactly, so I couldn't quite tell what's going on. Uh, if this is the before after specification, you should be clustering the uh, standard errors at the fund level, right? And by the way, I should note that even if you cluster at the fund level, that doesn't take care of the fact that there may be cross-sectional correlation across funds, right? So these T stats are way overblown in all likelihood. Kicking tires number five. Can you say anything about how well your benchmarks predict the returns of a closed end funds uh, in the estimation window? Right, if I'm not buying into the uh, normal return estimation, I'm not exactly sure of what to make of the abnormal returns that are backed out from the actual minus the normal. A couple of things, ideas for further analysis. Uh, I like the idea of looking at the heterogeneous effects in the latest iteration of the paper. Other dimensions along which you could actually try to split the sample, and some of these actually uh, follow discussions in, in the Bradley et al. paper. This come to enough, fraction of institutional ownership, average size of the trades in the fund stock, stagger board, fair enough, you only have 10%, but you also have 10% for the heterogeneity treatment you, uh, or breakdown you discussed, so maybe something comes out of this. And finally, directors with unlimited terms, which sounded like a, a, a version of a stagger board on steroids. Again, 10% only, but maybe worth a shot. So not enough time, but there are many more things there that I'll share with you later. Thank you. Um, do you want to collect, do you want to decide? You can sample select the question. So you might let Maria Sunta start. You'll ah. get a serious one up front. Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. I think this is very interesting. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether you could start your I think it's very interesting, and I'm wondering whether you could structure the empirical analysis in a way to rely a bit less uh, on uh, the rationality of uh, the investor in the close-end funds. For doing that, uh, I would look at uh, um, whether there are uh, any changes uh, in uh, the trading strategies uh, of the close-end funds. And uh, you could do that uh, even uh, looking at returns. Currently, you are uh, focusing on the alpha. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can test whether the exposure of uh, the close-end fund to portfolios that are supposed to give long-term returns change. So some of those tests uh, um, are um, in uh, my paper with a big Cameron that is uh, forthcoming in the RFS. And uh, so you could, uh, we just look at uh, the close-end structure versus the open-end structure. But uh, I think it's very interesting to ask whether the corporate governance of the fund matter above and beyond the organizational structure. Very helpful. Let me just, I want to take questions rather than comments, so just very briefly to say I, I'll certainly do that. Uh, we run a preliminary test where we look at cash on the balance sheet, and we see that after the 2009 event, they carry more cash on their balance sheet, which is consistent with this intuition, yeah. and that's something we'll certainly include in the next draft, yeah. and uh, we'll cite the RFS. Uh, the, um, uh, Emiliano's comment is very helpful. Um, just but very. Just a moment. I think that the cash is just a buffer, right? But the strategy is more what this company have to produce. So exposure to liquidity factor, to oh, sure. undervalued, is, I think it will be more informative. Absolutely, yes. It was yeah. first, the first cut. Um, uh, just to answer your very quick question on what's happening in Table 7, it is a before after specification. That's what we're doing. We'll make that clear in the table description. Um, and we do cluster by fund. You know, <laughs> This is a tough thing. You know, when you see something that's been published before, especially in a top journal, and you say, well, we follow them. You know, on the one hand, I can say, well, I followed them. They're published, you know, right? 
On the other hand, you're wondering uh, to what degree is that specification useful, especially the degree we have uh, correlation uh, in the cross section. And I think you're right to give that caveat, and we will in the revised draft of the paper. Thanks. Sure. Alan? Uh, if, a, if, a benefit of a, if the benefit of the, if there's variation in the cross section in terms of the value of tax deferral, because you have different, ta you know, there's different gains uh, by different closed end funds, and therefore the impact of opening the fund and realizing those gains is going to vary in the cross section, would that be worth looking at? That is to say, the poison pill uh, might help protect, be more valuable to protect funds with higher taxable gains that are being protected from opening the fund. And therefore, you could ascribe the value of the pill in some of these results to the cross-sectional variation in the tax benefit that's being protected. It's a great idea. We, uh, we looked at it. We, we had a hard time assessing the degree to which they have taxable gains. Um, but um, uh, we have some proxies. But we just had a hard time getting the data out. But it's a good idea. Jeff? Why do you think a fund that's under attack would add more cash on the balance sheet? Why wouldn't you do exactly the reverse, invest all of your cash into investments? On the theory that, um, in effect, well, I mean, you see where this is going, right? Uh, you're, it's, uh, <laughs> you're, you're increasing the threat point against uh, the activist investor by saying, guess what? Fire sale values, you're going to take a hit, which is probably going to uh, cover, in effect, the expected gains you get from uh, the liquidation of all the fund's assets. So, cool. so, or put otherwise, to the extent we see what seems to be um, a complacent strategy as opposed to a resistant strategy in balance sheet tactics of the type we've just described, what does that say about what's going through the fund director's minds when they face an attack by um, an activist. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. Um, just, so, just to be clear, I should clarify something I said early in response to the first question. Um, the, the result that we see more cash in the balance sheet is across all funds, not particular to those that have been the subject of an attack. So what I could do is, and what I will do, is cut the sample, see whether your analysis is right for those funds that have currently been or are, are under attack, that they do this sort of um, daring, this game of chicken you've described, which is to load up on illiquid assets and dare the activists to liquidate them in a fire sale. So why wouldn't that be a more effective strategy than anything else? It might if you're under attack already. All I'm saying is that the cash effect that I see is across all firms, not just those that are already under attack. I was describing a general result, not a particular one. Holger. The, the experiment that you are, do, that you are uh, studying is uh, uh, one where uh, a legal right that was perceived to be present is being deluded. And it seems to me that it's quite difficult to infer from that what is the ex ante value of the legal right. Why? Th these, are, these are two different things, OK? So s suppose you have a company, and the company uh, uh, is borrowing money, OK? Suddenly, there is an, ex an exogenous shock that dilutes the value of, the, of this liability. Obviously, the value of the firm will go up, right? That doesn't mean that ex ante, the value of borrowing is, is, is a negative thing, right? Sorry, so, so I'm not understanding that uh, the ex there's an exogenous shock that ha what happens, that you can no longer borrow and that you no longer have the borrowing option? I would agree that would be a parallel example. Yes, so, so uh, I mean, uh, the, the general point is that an ex post dilution and an ex ante value of a, of, of a right, of a legal right, are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, the, if the ex post dilution destroys values or creates value, that doesn't mean anything about, or I wouldn't say it doesn't mean anything, but you have to be more careful, I think, in the inference that you are drawing towards the ex ante value of the legal right. So how would you phrase the inference? How would I phrase yeah. the difference? How would you phrase the inference? What, what is the appropriate well, cause it's a, Well, I, I think that the points that, that were made here tells you something about the mechanics of what happens when the legal right is diluted. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can use it in order to build a, a, some sort of a structural argument of how the right ex ante works. Mm -hmm. But it's not a one-to-one. -one, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between the value of the dilution or the value destroyed by the value 
by the dilution and the value created by the right. But that's not our claim. We're not claiming that our point estimates are equivalent to the value of the legal right um, to adopt or not to adopt a poison pill. Our claim is just the, what are the directional value effects. What's the sign? What's the di directional effects of the, the value of this legal option? So even the sign could be the opposite. Uh, uh, yeah, one is the value of the commitment. One is, is, is the value. I mean, I, I can. So you don't like the, the example that I gave. But if you commit to pay money, right, you have created a liability. The liability is diluted, exposed, right? Right. The value of, of the company is going to increase. That doesn't mean that the creating the value ex ante is, a, is, is, is value decreasing. So even the sign can go in the opposite direction. So I'll give this a little more thought. Yeah, maybe we could talk a little, uh, a little bit about it off, offline. So Rob, I have a question about the, the mechanism by which this poison pill might be um, positive for, for, for the fund. I understand that they have illiquid assets and you, know, you don't want to sell them down. But anybody who takes them over becomes the owner of those assets. Why would they want to liquidate the... I mean, they would be shooting themselves in the foot if they did that. Now, of course, if you can ask for a redemption, you can be first in line, right. then you can get your cash out, but my understanding is you'd have to liquidate the entire fund, and if you get the size of block, as Emiliano said, that's required to actually, where the poison pill would actually bite, and you could actually vote them out of office and so on, you'd, you'd be owning half the fund, or something along those lines, so you'd be taking most of the hit of that um, liquidity uh, discount, so why, why would you do that? Why would that be a credible threat? I think it's related to Jeff's question. He's wondering, for a similar reason, why you just don't, right? Why you just don't load up? You know, I want to say something about this fire sale hypothesis. Um, so, strictly speaking, if investors are completely rational, I'm, I don't want to give a lot of weight to this fire sale hypothesis. Why? Because, for the reason Holger's just given, right? To the degree that someone takes it over and they face liquid assets, and they, if they believe that the assets are have the net asset value value, they won't do this. They'll just hold the assets and wait for them to come to maturity and collect the NAV. So the, I'm going to cheat. The answer I'm going to give you is going to be a behavioral response. These two sets of investors have different views about whether NAV reflects the accurate value of the assets. The activist takes the view that they're worth less. The investors who are currently in the fund take the view that they're actually worth the true NAV. And it's this disagreement that causes the value decrease. But it, I'm cheating, right? It's, I made a behavioral move. To be fair, it's an area where behavioral stuff is happening. Um, but then, of course, you could come back and say, well, then why do I care about event study results? So I don't want to go too far down there, but I'll get in trouble. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to suggest that instead of looking at it only as an event for the targets, potential targets, you also look at it as an event for the potential acquirers. Um, because there's two sides to the coin here, right? You have the targets, which may or may not benefit, and then um, the acquirers. Cool. And if you could actually show the flip side, that the acquirers might move in opposite directions in terms of their announcement effects, that would be sort of supportive evidence, and it might allow you to sidestep some of these benchmark issues. That's a great idea. That's my whole response to that question. Uh, no, that's, I think it's a fantastic idea. And th 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 there'd be data limitations. We can talk about maybe over coffee. You know, it's hard to get the investors. A lot of these are retail individual investors. But for the activists, for um, the Horsiercy, et cetera, we can certainly look at that. It's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I think that uh, the argument for the body of uh, takeover defense is generally assumed uh, shareholder myopia. Uh, the shareholders uh, uh, don't understand the long-term uh, long value of, uh, of the management, long-term strategy of the management, and welcome the uh, hostile takeovers or hedge fund optimism, uh, which give them a short-term profit without appreciating that such behavior uh, will deteriorate, deteriorate uh, their long-term value. So and, uh, my question is, if, uh, if the, take the value of takeover difference uh, uh, assumes such a shareholder myopia, is such a, is such a value can be, uh, can such a value be evaluated uh, uh, by the event study? 
event study assumes that the shareholders are rational and uh, the, and the short, -time, uh, short term reaction of share price uh, can reflect the long term value of the, any corporate actions. I think it's sometimes, some, some, somewhat uh, contradic uh, uh, you set on contradicting uh, assumptions. So I think I, I said a little bit about why you'd be skeptical about event study methodology for this uh, class of assets. Um, you know, you could, one answer I could give you, first of all, I would just modify what you've said. I'm not sure that the argument for takeover defenses requires a claim about shareholder myopia. What it requires is, is, in, is different sets of information. This is not a totally implausible claim. You know, we can, we can talk more about, but I don't think it requires shareholders um, to be myopic. Um, otherwise, Marty will be very upset uh, if, if I agree to that. I think, um, uh, in terms of does, it, does the event study make an assumption about rationality, so can we use them in this area? What I'd say is, um, that's why I have some skepticism about the use of a short-term window. That's why Emiliano is right that I should use a longer-term window. But suppose I show you that over a much longer period, Investors in this fund consistently react negatively to the development. Does that tell us nothing? Simply because we think that shareholders in this area are not strictly rational? Or does it tell us that their expectations have changed in a meaningful way? And you might say, this just shows, your, the summary of your paper, Jackson, is that crazy people are crazy. Fair enough. Yeah, okay, I, I can accept that possible interpretation, but it's not the only one, I would say. And then the question is, is introducing that bit of knowledge uh, valuable? Alan. Event studies don't assume market rationality. Right. It, it measures whether it's a high level price reaction. It does not assume that. Anyway. The answer to that is there's no assumption. So I thought no. about giving that answer, but is that right, Alan? Because a standard event study claim, isn't it, is that the value of the asset has changed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's measuring whether there's an abnormal stock price reaction relative to your event window. It does not assume. You can test for market rationality using an event study, but using an event study doesn't assume market rationality. I could say they're crazy beforehand, they're crazy afterwards. I think to Alan's point, they're crazy beforehand, they're crazy afterwards, and I show you the difference in their crazy over time. I think that would be Alan's point. Uh, Merrick? So, uh, two points there, it seems to me, Alan's right, but what conclusions you draw from the statistically <laughs> abnormal reaction may depend on rationality. But going back to the fire sale, going back to the fire sale question, uh, if these sales are being made and people know the reason is it's a liquidation of uh, a closed-end fund, then there's no assumption that there's informed trade. So there shouldn't be a big liquidity hit from that. Sorry, there's no assumption there's informed trading about the... It, about the fact that people are selling. And therefore, you wouldn't expect a major price decrease if you're selling a large amount of stock. Oh, no, 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 right. So one reason, the, the asset that I have in mind when I talk about this fire sale risk is a particular kind of asset that these funds trade in heavily, the municipal bond. So mo many of these funds are structured and arranged around a municipal bond portfolio, and the whole idea, these are very illiquid assets. These are right, okay. hard. So you might think of it differently in that context. Okay. Um, I was thinking of it in terms of equity. Yeah, I didn't specify that. Why don't you collect a few more? Sure. Please. Uh, just, just a tiny point, to make your story about uh, funds having been under attack treated differently, uh, you may want to tell something about the distance between the event and the attack, because uh, this effect might wear off uh, if, if investors just don't remember yeah. that three years down uh, the line they have been under attack, uh, but now things are looking entirely differently. Yeah, this goes to Emiliano's point about showing a clearer story about how the funds respond, how, how many attacks happen or don't happen in response to the events. Uh, I just have, would like to make a broader point on about what do we learn about takeover events in general. Whereas, as, as you cast at the beginning, if you compare your close end funds with normal firms, there is a discussion of in, incumbent management doing this long term stuff, mm -hmm. which is bloody good, or is it agency problem? But the basic point is the perception of the underlying firm value is going to be hugely different. And here we just have a bunch of assets, and it doesn't really matter who owns them. The value is sort of. So we don't really learn much directly about the value of of the defenses 
helping long-term investment, which is claimed to be valuable versus reduction in agents. I'm very and open on, to on that. On top of that, I, it's entirely beyond me, of the course, when hard 80, how you can ever make a successful bid on a close and mutual fund. Well, folks, folks have made successful bids, but I, I, I'm very open to your argument. Let me give you the other argument, see if you, what Marty would say. You've given Lucian's argument. Marty would say, oh, firms, operating firms everywhere have the illiquid assets. They're a collection of this thing called research and development. That's illiquid that people disagree about the value of, and that makes them comparable here. Now, you might disagree. Maybe I do, too. But I think this paper can be agnostic on this question and should be agnostic on this question because I don't know the generalizability of these results. Ron? Uh, I can yell. Um, um, Close-end funds are really interesting. And they're interesting with, res they're interesting with respect to uh, Marty's claim about the difficulty of valuation and valuing long-term. Uh, the difficulty of valuing long-term uh, investments. Remember, the very first, uh, the very first public venture capital fund was a closed-end mutual fund, the American Research uh, and Development, uh, and it was being priced with no transparency into the uh, into the portfolio because there wasn't any. Um, the interesting thing about the closed-end funds is that perhaps some of them are trading in liquid assets. They're trading in, uh, they're trading in foreign markets uh, where there's very little liquidity uh, and where even open-ended funds are, uh, are determining their net asset, net asset value uh, by uh, marking, uh, marking the model rather than uh, marking the market. So one, one, way, one approach to it, assuming the data is available, is to be able to see how much difference there is between open-end funds that have essentially the same illiquid assets uh, and the manner in which the open-ended funds are marketing, are marketing based on a model rather than based on trading prices because there at least you have somebody, you have a, one assessment uh, about how to, deal, uh, how to deal with the information problem. Uh, the other is, the, the other wonderful thing about these, the claim, dealing with Marty's claim about this is all about the long term. Um, it's, it's funny to, to frame what the long term story is in a closed end fund that is actually investing in tradable assets even if they're relatively illiquid. If they're, if they're making a claim that the, uh, the market will figure this out if they only hold on to it long enough, then if half of the, if half of the closed end funds uh, defeat an effort to open up it, you've got a pretty clear measure of whether there's the, the claim that they're in the long run, the, their uh, strategy uh, will be uh, will be validated. Uh, you can test it across uh, across the universe, uh, and the potential for irrationality on the part of the uh, investment manager, the investment managers of the closed end fund, who may uh, who may uh, uh, may suffer from hubris about the belief in their own, uh, in their own success uh, and have that hubris um, at least um, for themselves hedged by the fact that they, the longer they wait, the more money they have. So, I mean, so you've got to ask, you've got to see, you, it's, it may be that you've got a sample where you, actually, you can actually assess whether the long-term claim that is associated with the justification for <coughs> Um, for blocking the short-term strategy of opening the fund, uh, whether, whether and how frequently um, it actually works. Right. right. And as Emilio pointed out, the answer is not so frequently. But I can certainly look at the, uh, the, the return effects as between the firms. Well, the firms that are opened die. Um, but the firms that, that, that resist the attack, I can look specifically to the results with them and see what we can learn.